so, so many times I see her re-watching the same thing because she's like, the other one switched with me, then she watched the finale. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want her to Game of Thrones, then they're all fighting. <laughs> Who can see? Should I hire someone who's struggling with a mental health condition? This is your daily catch-up. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Beyond the Label. So Beyond the Label is a nationwide movement against mental health stigma which started in 2018. And I think as most of us here would know, despite the increasingly healthy conversations surrounding the topics of mental health in Singapore, mm. there still remains quite a gap between people who struggle with mental health conditions as well as the general public. Mm -hmm. So today we have Devika here with Ooh. us. She has very kindly joined us. She's a mental health advocate and personally has the experience of her own struggles as well as being a caregiver to her sister. Oh, Correct. Wow. Yep. Yeah. That's so right. she's here to share her personal experiences with us and help us better understand how to support our peers. Welcome! Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the show! Hey. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think like I just mentioned, like the existing perception towards mental health in Singapore right, still leans towards something that's slightly negative, mm. I would say, because like people still find it difficult to take that first step to go to therapy, for example, or to even talk about it with their loved ones. Yeah. Mm. And then it almost seems as though like now anyone on the street is saying that, oh, I am depressed, oh, I have anxiety. <laughs> and they're throwing words around, you know, mm. without any proper basis or diagnosis. And some of them might even be using it to try to excuse some of their behaviour. Mm. Yeah, so how do you all think the conversation surrounding mental health has progressed in Singapore over the years? Mm, do you want to go first? Or? Sh sure. <laughs> Straight away, Tai Chi. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I feel like it's like coffee, right? You know how like coffee where like in the third wave movement, or something like I feel like the conversations Coffee? around what? yeah 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 I know that was a very weird yeah, energy yeah. waiting to see how this connects as no value, right? <laughs> I feel like we are in a second wave of like mental health discussion and like dialogue because mm, mm. we obviously got through the first phase which was the no one was talking about it at all and now there's conversations mm, about it right yeah. more media is covering it more YouTube channels like Melissa Singapore started talking about it. Oh. We, we've actually made quite a lot of progress. Yeah. I think we should acknowledge that. Mm. But then comes different issues when you come across first wave conversation topics, right? I feel yeah. like we already skipped the step of people, or maybe not skip the step, like maybe it's it's transitioning already. But I remember like maybe three three years ago where there were a lot of YouTubers coming out and then la like slapping the labels of like depression or mm -hmm. mental health issues and all that. And then getting called out for it by this woke crowd mm. and then after that now we've kind of moved past that already where people are not really fully using it for like branding purposes you know what i mean it's for the like market correction branding. yeah it's already corrected <laughs> itself in some sense now it's just more of the what kind of conversations we're having about mental health and yeah. whether there can be more it's quite interesting because when we previously had mr chanju singh on who is the minister of education right he actually explained that like in schools they're actually trying to build like friend circles like to check in on one another and then I also think that they're trying to have more regular like talks and all that right and now counselling is available in school so I do think that there's a bit of progress being made here and there mm. and earlier on we were speaking about like what wave we are in right yeah. I think it's interesting because you can see the movement past the just talking about it to how can we actually implement certain things to be of practical help in school at work I love that you brought it up because um, I have a bunch of friends who have kids now mm. and it's very interesting for me to talk to them because they know words like um, like emotional words they know that oh, I'm feeling quite jealous right I feel frustrated and then they can identify that emotion yeah. and convey it yeah and these are kids that are like 5-6 years old when I was oh. 5 or 6 I just angry <laughs> happy angry like that was it like for me yeah. right back then so when I asked them like how come you know these kind of words they were like oh we teach my teacher teaches teach us that in school okay. so I'm like oh, not bad. Hmm. and I thought it was really really important because sometimes it's really the a matter of not knowing what is it that you're feeling yeah. Yeah. that impedes you from being able to communicate that. Yeah. Mm. So being able to establish that with kids from an early age could just make them more effective communicators in the future. So I thought it was really, really nice. Good time to be alive. I yeah. think something that I've seen on Reddit that was quite interesting is that there was this comment that talked about how amongst the younger generation, right, people are quite accepting and open to discussing such issues. Mm. But then in a professional sense, it still feels like you need to hide certain things. Yeah. And I also wonder like if I'm an employer, right? Mm. And I know someone has extreme or like quite bad depression or anxiety, right? Mm. Versus another candidate who maybe similar qualifications, but is not struggling. Would I then pick the second candidate? You know what I mean? I think and this is that one, fair? 
you have to look at it from a point of what is it that the corporation is looking for. A lot of times businesses want productivity and they want mm. efficiency, right? And it is an undeniable fact that when you are affected by mental health conditions, it would affect your productivity as well. A big chunk of your time and energy is put into trying to maintain yourself. And a lot of the time mental health conditions also come from trauma situations, circumstantial situations, and it's almost like a privilege if you don't have mental health conditions. Right. Mm. Yeah, so it is an upper hand when you have a stable life and a stable emotional regulation system uh, that allows you to put more of your energy and time into actually excelling yourself in your career and when you when you're capable of doing that naturally then you have more opportunities accessible to you so perhaps this whole um, the way that it is all taking place is a good opportunity for companies and corporations the current capitalistic system mm. that's in place to revisit ourselves and maybe even revamp ourselves. Stop right there unless you're on the way to therapy. Like, share and subscribe. And in fact, I think there's quite a lot of companies, uh, Gravity included, since John is not here, I guess I'm doing the Gravity plugs. Um, <laughs> where I think like almost maybe three or four years ago, we introduced um, Every month, everyone gets one quote. I don't even know if you know this. Every month? There's every one month, There's one mental health day. Like, you can take a mental health day. Maybe not once every month. I can't remember. I, I heard there is the, one year, two, th- two oh, days. Oh, one year, two days. Okay. So, <laughs> totally what, different from every one, month. One year, two days, right? You can take a mental health day, right? Which is really, like, up to you. You want to just <laughs> relax, just to really... Yeah. Or maybe it's about going to therapy or it's going, like, speaking to someone mm. or whatnot. I feel like it's not just one day. Like, you give me one day to take oh, a break, right? Mm. I'm not going to fucking reset it. Like, yeah. it's That's such what a I was going to say as well. Yeah. I don't think you can just reset in one day. Sometimes it's an accumulation of several things that leads to you having such intense burnouts and all you can do that one day is just stone. You won't even be able to like Process. get back on your feet or you won't be able to basically reset your system. Mm. Uh, at least in my personal uh, experience, yeah. that's how it has been. I, I did have depression about 10 years ago and this was like in uni and like mm. I, I was very lucky enough to like kind of get out of that through a really good support system and friends. Obviously, there'll be times when those things like relapse la, after mm. a while and so like I think maybe in 2018 or 2019 something quite traumatic happened to me at that time usually it would spring up every once in a while like maybe once every two months mm. I'll have an episode where I wouldn't be able to sleep until like say 8am in the morning and that would be very unproductive for me if like, like I had to continue work mm. and so if that would be playing in my mind and I know that look like this whole day I'm just going to be completely useless because I had like one hour of sleep like I knew that okay I had this option to take a day off for mental health right. recuperate on sleep for one but also kind of just okay I don't have the distraction of work I can really just gather my thoughts and figure out how, how or why this episode happened mm. and so it was, it was very specific and if this day even though it was only one day didn't exist it would have been even worse had I had to go right. to work mm. yeah. for okay, sure I for see. sure that's why I feel like it is definitely an improvement in our current community that we have such options now mm. but I do think that we can do so much more, right? I do think that we can incorporate counselling or counsellors within organisations to offer mental health support if you don't want to take up like a day off but Mm -hmm. you just want someone where you can go and just confide and have a safe space to talk about it. I do think that's something we can incorporate. I do agree that I think having counsellors makes sense. I think not all organisations have the resources to do Mm -hmm. so but they can partner with quite a lot of other vendors. So like, there was a time where I really just needed an SOS call. I can't remember, it was one of the telemedicine apps. Before this, it was just like physical ailments or whatever, right? Now a lot of them have Psychiatric mental health consult- options. Yeah, yes. Like a counsellor or psychologist oh. on the go. Like mm. within 30 minutes, you can already speak to someone. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And it's quite cool, yeah. We'll- yeah. So for yourself, right? What are you diagnosed with? Mm. And what led you to want to go and seek professional help for that? Okay, so... I don't know if y'all need trigger warning, I'll just say trigger warning, mm. la, abuse, la, okay? So when I was a child, I was actually sexually abused by a family friend. At that point, I didn't understand the trauma of it all. Like it was, I was just okay. too young to understand what the hell is this, what's going on. I just thought he was just being kind and loving towards me. And it wasn't until a few years later that I understood what was happening. So I guess that is PTSD. My diagnosis earlier, I think about three years ago, I was diagnosed with moderately severe depression. Mm. I didn't know that was a category. Yeah, I didn't know moderately they had that. Moderate, yeah. not moderate, not severe. Moderately, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I was like, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> um, I was diagnosed with that. But other than that, I'm not really diagnosed with any other conditions. I did have a psychologist offer me a schema therapy. A lot of times it... Um, 
it starts in your childhood and then through life experiences or recurring patterns in your life, it gets more and more reinforced in your life mm. internally. So I noticed that as I grew older, I started like attracting the same kind of people, even though they were of different walks of life. Like they are not in any way similar to each other. But when it came to like relationship dynamic, it was always I'm the one overcompensating. Mm. Okay. So it was like, what's going on here? And why is it that I keep attracting these kind of people? It's like recurring toxic relationship patterns. Yes. And schemas, there are like 18 different types of schemas. And most of us have some of these. It's just whether is it so much to the point that it has affected your quality of life? Are you making subconscious decisions that are bad for you? Mm. Are you not able to set proper boundaries for yourself? These are the kind of things that... And you were doing all this at 24. Mm. Right, right. So between the ages of seven, seven where it happened and 24, there was there was nothing like in terms of therapy or, or getting help? Or um, my mom did bring me to a therapist. I mean, my parents found out about the whole abuse and everything and then they took it to court. So I was very grateful that they did the right thing there. But I think my parents were also not very equipped to support me emotionally about it. Like they did what was right as for protocol. But when we came back from the court and everything, like the guy was sentenced to six years in prison and whatnot. But... Um, after the whole thing was settled, they just came back and told me to forget that it ever, ever happened. Right. They were just like, oh, think of it like a bad dream. We don't want you to think about this. As I grew older and started recognizing that this is a trauma and this is something terrible that has happened to me, I didn't feel comfortable talking to my parents about it because I felt like I can't. They wouldn't understand. Yeah. It's not that they wouldn't understand. I'm sure that if I did, they would have found a way to provide me the help yeah, that yeah. I needed. It's just that impression that they left in me, which is, mm. don't talk about it. Mm. Right, you know, right, don't talk right. about it. So I'm like, okay. And there were several incidents where I tried to tell like a teacher and my teacher kind of just told me I'm lying and I'm just like, okay. So it's it's a whole lot of things. Like. Anyways, in 2018, I went for an audition in Vasantham for Miss V Supreme, which is basically Miss Vasantham. Oh. <clears throat> Slight flex. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Miss Vasantham 2018. I am. Oh. I'm, I'm Miss Vasantham 2019. Oh. That's right. Uh, anyways. So. Uh, <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. I'm very shy now. Uh, but yeah, so when I went for that audition, and at that point, my Tamil wasn't like great. Lah. So when I went there, I was freaking out. I had like a full on anxiety attack for the first time in my life. And that was so. It was such a perspective shift for me because up till that point, I considered myself a very confident person and like my confidence was unshakable. Did you know at that point that it was an anxiety attack? I just knew something was wrong. Like I was like holding the mic and I was like, like this, <laughs> shaking. And I thought like it was such a mess. Like right. I thought when people watch it on television, they're going to see how, how much of a mess I was. So I was right. really nervous about that. Yeah. But then when I watched the episode, I seemed like the calmest person. And that's when I was like, oh my God, a lot of these things that we feel are very internal and people don't see it from the outside. But after that audition, I came back home and I cried a lot because I was like, who am I anymore? I don't know who I am. You know, this is not who I am. Or what if I'm like slowly losing myself? And this is like a real concern for me because mental health is something or mental health conditions are something that is prevalent in my family. Like my older sister has dissociative identity disorder. She has depression. She has anxiety. She has like five different diagnoses. Her onset was like from age 18, but it started like being more prominent around the time that I was also like around the time that she was 24 and I was 24 at the time of the audition. So right, I was like, right, right. it's happening to me! <laughs> I was so the scared. Cost, cost I was like, it's, yeah, it's coming. It's got me. The mental health monster has got me. So I was really, really terrified. And up till that point, like I was of course happy that my older sister was going for therapy and all this. But I think I had my own internalized stigma about it. I didn't want to seek help. Because mm. right. I was like, I don't want to be diagnosed. I don't want these doctors to be uh, dramatic and say oh my god look at you you're still a victim of your childhood trauma and I think being strong and overcoming that whole incident was very important to me my mom encouraged me to go see the therapist so I went and I went to polyclinic I got a referral to Kutekport Hospital I saw the psychologist there she asked me to fill up this whole worksheet about feelings like how you feel about things about 100 questions and it 100 had, questions wow. mm, 100 wow. questions and you just have to <laughs> fill it up from like it's like the strongly disagree to disagree that range thing. Oh, okay. So it's yeah, not like it's long paragraph answers. Nah, thank okay, God. Okay. Because the way I, I would never make it. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I would just never go back if that was the case. <laughs> I was just be like, it's okay. I'll <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, luckily, just uh, agree. Okay, okay. Yeah, just agree. So I just had to pick. So the first time I filled it up, because I had to fill it up twice. The first time I filled it up, <laughs> 
I was using a lot of like my logical thinking because a right. lot of it just doesn't seem logically correct to me lah. The questions are like, I feel like my parents hate me. I feel like uh, life is worthless. I feel like all alone in this world. But logically thinking, I'm not what. So I put a lot of it like disagree, disagree. Yeah. Right. Then she say, go do again. Because I can see you're just thinking and answering based off of logic. Mm, yeah. Okay, Then okay. she say, I want you to feel. Think about how you feel. Because your feelings can be opposite of logic. It would be nice of her to say that before you did the first time. Yeah, blast. right? I would have been like, well, thanks. <laughs> and now I have to go waste another one hour doing this. <laughs> she see her stuck on the cushion for like five minutes <laughs> yeah, and she yeah, never yeah. say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did it again properly this time. When I came back, then she was like, okay, I can analyze it now. Right, so right. she did it. This time around, uh, the therapist or my psychologist, she found out that I have the most prominent schema of defectiveness where I internally believe I'm a very defective individual. Right. And I'm like, and she's like, so why why do you feel this way? Why is it that, why do you think this could be the case? And I'm just like, it doesn't make sense. I'm a very confident person. I'm very cool. I'm like, I, I do well in everything that I do. Um, I have a lot of friends, you know, I just kept trying to find all these things to tell her that I'm not. I think there's an error in the in the questionnaire that she gave me. And she's like, do you realize that you're overcompensating? And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> hold up. You're doing your job a bit too well. <laughs> 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 But it did give me, like, it like snapped me out of that whole thing. And I realized that you're right. I am overcompensating, which is why I kept like doing things beyond my means, even if it meant it was at a detriment of my feelings, detriment of my health. Finally, through conversing with her, I somehow, the words just came out and I told her that I feel so worthless that I feel like the only way I can prove that I'm worthy of even being here, even existing, is to put every ounce of my being into use. Right. Like make sure it is of some sort of productiveness. That's when my healing journey started. Because it was painful as heck to acknowledge that about myself. All my life, whatever I was doing, my entire drive, right, was coming from a place of lack. And I had to put that fire out if I wanted to have a more sustainable, healthier way of living. Right after I, like, you know, extinguished that fire, I had nothing. I had no motivation. I had no drive. I was absolutely unproductive. I couldn't even recognize who I was anymore. But yep. I do realize now in hindsight that that was a necessary process for me to go through because there was a lot of unpacked issues in my in my mind, my heart. And I just had to work through all of it and come out of it the other side. So I'm currently in the process of that still. Mm. Thank wow. you very much for sharing that. Heavy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Doesn't look like it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did your parents... So you mentioned that your parents was the one that actually first encouraged you to go and seek help, right? My mom, yes. Is this because of the experience that your family had with your sister? Yes. So when my older sister first got her diagnosis, it was in eight, when she was 18 years old. Mm. And how old were you then? 12. Okay. My parents didn't know how to react. They kept thinking that she was just being very dramatic. And of course, they were worried for her. But I don't think they could express that properly. So they didn't have the information that they needed to properly support her. Back then, it really wasn't spoken about as much. And like the thought of going to IMH was just like, oh, you're crazy. Mm. You know, you're not like, you have a mental health condition. It's not that. It's you are just crazy. That's why you go to IMH. So that was the whole stigma. Her whole condition just like degenerated way more. And if we had addressed those things at that point of time, I don't think she would have had this thing called dissociative identity disorder. Or it wouldn't have been as severe as it is today. So for those of you who don't know what's dissociative identity disorder, it's basically split personality. Mm. But it's the correct term for split personality now. Um, because of intensive trauma in your life, your mind breaks itself up into different parts. So you have different people coming forward. It's all you, essentially. But it's just different parts of you that comes forward depending on what kind of situation you're in. If you're perceiving danger, then a more bold part of you might come forward. If you're perceiving sadness, a suicidal part of you might come forward. So for her, she's split. I think she's got 53 different parts at this point. 53? Whoa. Yeah, she's one of the most severe cases in Singapore. Like we are, I think most people will be quite out of their depth when they come to the actual topic of talking about DID, right? Mm. And most people's impressions of it would come from movies, like say, Split. For, like Split. Yeah. And then <laughs> so yeah. Uh. So if you're able to <laughs> <laughs> like to explain a bit, right? Like how does how does it look like in real life? You know what I mean? To some extent, I think the movies did portray it correctly, but in other aspects, they failed. So um, when my, my older sister does have child parts to her. Right. So when her child parts come out, it's very obvious that they are 
child. Like her entire mannerism changes. Her um, handwriting changes. She's not able to read sometimes. Essentially, it's all still my older sister. It's just different parts of her memories or different mm. parts of her from different time periods and stuff. The most volatile one for her is this um, part called Angie. So she has different names for her different parts as well. Angie is a very powerful, angry force. So Angie comes forward when my older sister Gaia, her name is Gayatri, so we call her Gaia. Gaia is threatened in any way. Gaia feels unsafe in any place and Gaia has anyone around her who's not cooperating with her to establish a safe environment. Angie will come forward and Angie do not care about repercussion. Okay. Mm. But the one thing that we find very interesting about her is that all her parts are very cooperative with me and my younger sister. Mm. So it doesn't matter who else tries to interfere as long as me and my younger sister come forward and we try to calm Angie down. Angie will calm down because Angie has a soft spot for us. Yeah. Whoa. But if anyone else tries to come forward, Angie did not give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so when she when she calms down, then she switches back to Gaia I mean, or she might switch back to another personality. Also throughout part. the day, several personalities mm. will come forth. It's, not it's, like, it's technically it part. La. They are called part. They are called alters. Right, so right. it's not necessarily like a personality that changes. Right. It's just different parts of you emerges. It's kind of like, okay, let me put it in more relatable content. Let's say I go and hang out with my boyfriend versus who I am with my friends. I'm two different people, right? right. Like I'm, there's two versions of me. That's essentially what's happening okay, with my right. older sister, except it's not within her control when she switch. She don't recall anything that happens. Right. She has no recollection of what okay. happens. Yeah. So sometimes she could she could have switched out for like days, and then she wakes up back as Gaia, and she's just like, "What day is it? Mm. How long has it been?" And she also has parts that pretends to be Gaia. So she has an imposter part, imposter Gaia version, that comes forward to convince everyone that she's still Gaia, but she isn't her. So my 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 sister is married, so she has a. I have a brother-in-law. She's a husband. He's the one who can truly identify when it's not her. My older sister has been going for therapy, intensive therapy, for about seven years now, and it's uh, the therapy that she goes for is called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization oh. and reprocessing. So for her, the past seven years, it has helped her so much that right now she can communicate when she has switched. She can let us know that this is the part that has come forward. Oh. This is what I need from you. This is what you can do to prevent me from splitting further or prevent me from um, going violent or hurting right, myself. Right. So we have a very good communication system put in place now and any caretaker who has a person with mental health condition at home who tends to have tendency to self-harm and stuff. Everyone has to figure out this thing called a crisis plan. Oh. So we are at that place where my older sister can also now tell us, be prepared with your crisis plan. So mm. crisis plan can be things like the moment she's triggered or what, um, one person in the house is in charge of hiding all the sharp objects, one person in charge of locking all the windows, uh, hiding the keys so that she don't just leave the house mm. and one person has to be on standby with her medication that can help calm her down another person can be on standby to call the ambulance if there's a need be. Yeah. Right. so this whole thing is a crisis plan so when you say recovery for this specific uh, condition it's really about how everybody can work together including herself to manage it mm. there's no cure or somehow like yeah there's no real cure but there have been times when let's say she feels like a certain part no longer has a role in her life it just disappears. Oh. It goes away. Okay. How often is Gaia present? Um, I would say at this point it's about a good 75%. Is oh, Gaia. Wow. Yeah. So she's really improved. One thing I've noticed is when Gaia is in a stable environment, she is very much in control. So there are parts of her that wants to like she has creative parts, she has parts that likes baking, she has parts that hates cleaning. And if let's say she wants to cook or she needs to do her meal prep, she calls forward. Oh. She requests the help of the part that is very good at cooking. So it's oh. almost like... What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a superpower. <laughs> Wait yeah, a yeah. second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, On a good, but there are days where the part is like, no mood. <laughs> then she's like, ah, oh, guess I'll do it Why myself. Why am I always the one cooking? <laughs> No way lah. So the dish is like, oh, I, uh, time to cook dinner, then just... 
Oh, dinner is done. <laughs> no dinner. <laughs> she wake up again. Okay, yeah, so the thing is, sometimes, sometimes she can, like the part allows her to also be conscious. So so if like say you're chilling with her and then you're watch, you are like following like a TV show or a series, then you'll watch the finale together. Mm. Then after that, you find out that a different part watched the finale. <laughs> yeah. Then you have to rewatch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so many times I see her rewatching the same thing because she's like, the other one switched with me. Then she watched the finale. <laughs> then I don't want her to the spoil. Course, then they're all fighting. <laughs> Who can see? But I'm also curious, right? Mm. As Because you mentioned when she was first seeking help, she was 18 and you were 12. Mm. So as a young child, right? Did you understand what was going on with her or what was that process like learning how to take care of her in a sense? Um, I think at that point, I still didn't have to take care of her. Right. But at that point, I was a bit confused because she used to harm herself as well. And I used to see those marks and wonder, why is she doing this? Mm. Like, what are you doing? And it was quite a difficult process for me to empathize with her because when I was growing up and feeling very insecure with myself or when I was getting bullied in school, she was the person who taught me to stand up for myself. She was the person who, like in my eyes, she's my superhero because she's always so strong and so independent and capable and like I've always wanted to be like her. When I was old enough to understand that she has a condition um, and when she was diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, I genuinely thought that she was just bullshitting. Yeah, because at that point, I still didn't think that it was real. So her initial diagnosis was not DID, right? No, her initial was depression and then she had anxiety and then she went to US to complete her masters so this is the thing she's also extremely brilliant like she's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met it was even harder for me to accept that she has this condition because Mm. back then I'm like if you're so smart and you're so capable why you must struggle you can Mm. just not struggle right Right, I know. Mm. Ignorant yes. as yeah. just figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I was we, like, we, just, we all, <laughs> I was just like, just cheer up. Like it's not that hard. No. <laughs> it was, it was, it was bad. I wasn't a very good sister at that point, so I must admit. Mm. So throughout that period, right before like uh, getting diagnosed and whatnot, were, were you all very present in each other's lives to the yeah. point where you would see everything? I know? think she hid it for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I could see that she was very volatile. Like she was a very aggressive person for a huge part of her life. But right. to me, I was like, yeah. <laughs> as long as she wasn't aggressive with Stand me, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to me, it was like, you go my sis. You know? yeah, because I would think that mental health, like especially when you're struggling with something, right? Like it's so hard for you to open up and talk to other yeah. people about it. So in, in your sister's situation, were you the one who went up to her and brought it up and asked her? Or was it like mm. when she was ready, then she finally, or when I she think, couldn't take it anymore, then she... Yeah, she couldn't take it anymore and then she went. I don't think any of us actually spoke to her about anything. We just thought it was just her being like PMS. She went as in by herself. <laughs> we just thought she PMS. Yeah, so many trigger words. I think we need to, I always start a trigger warning. No, but I'm saying like genuinely, this was what happened back then. Yeah. This was genuinely what I thought back then. Of course, I'm a very different person today. I'm educated. So she went for therapy I'm aware as in on her own without your um, family's knowledge first. I think she tried to um, hurt herself and then we called the ambulance and that's oh. so she, yeah. I don't have a lot of recollection of that as well. Right. Like it, it's, all of it is quite a blur because I was also dealing with my own, yeah. um, you know, reality and trying to understand my own trauma, all that. I think th- a very interesting process process that I went through was comparing my experience with her. Because to me, it's like, I went through such an intense trauma. Why you have, yeah? Why you like worse than me? Mm. Like that. It was mm. very unkind of me, definitely. But it is, it goes to show that um, human nature, we tend to compare who has it worse and who ha- doesn't have it as bad. Um, and I think this is a very good thing to address as well, which is not everyone ex- process trauma the same. And I think that's also what makes it very challenging in the mental health scene. Mm. So how did you eventually manage to open up to your parents about what you were going through? Um, my mom could see. I think at this point, my mom and dad identified the errors in their ways and they realised how they could have been of support to my older sister. My mom actually signed all of us up for this Caregiver Alliance course. It's a 13-week course that teaches you everything you need to know about mental health. Oh. And my mom, it was really like a last resort thing because my whole family was kind of falling apart. There was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of just misunderstanding, ego, pride, a lot of, oh, as parents, we have done so much for you. Why can't you just be grateful that you have a good life here? You know, that kind of thing, right? So my mom decided perhaps it's good to educate ourselves and signed us up for this Caregiver Alliance course. That course changed my life. Like it really 
helped me understand that whatever my sister was doing or out of her her own manipulative tendencies and all especially when her condition got progressively worse and we were not aware that this was dissociative identity disorder or that this was borderline personality disorder we didn't know he wasn't mm. diagnosed yet at that point there was so much judgment towards her because we were like why are you being like this why are you being so bitchy why are you being so manipulative why are you being so selfish yep. and he was always targeted as at her as an individual and through this course i learned that people with mental health conditions tend to project these traits and it's not always a reflection of their character in fact they might beat themselves up more because they can't control these impulses mm-hmm. and that's where we need to educate ourselves and understand that this is a part of the condition that they have it's not who they are so that separation was very important to me it gave me a lot of resources to be a better support system for my older sister and it allowed me to start accepting that she really has a condition and what she needs for now it's not my judgment not my scrutiny not my unsolicited advice on what she can do about her life but rather my compassion understanding and patience so your whole family went for the course together yeah damn how much is this course yeah it was free <laughs> oh. it's free yeah it was half free oh, wow. send me the link yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah can 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 but it's it's specifically <laughs> for like <laughs> caregivers it's specifically for caregivers yeah. yeah so we fit the bill so we went for it i think that it was also what equipped my mom with the ability to come and tell me go for a therapy did you ever experience a caregiver burnout with your sister oh absolutely <laughs> my god is it not part your uh, side <laughs> no it was because that is it's so it is a very exhausting thing because while yes there is a separation now now you know that it's the condition it's not your sister it's so hard to sometimes not resent them mm. my parents uh, at that point my older sister had um broken off from the family after she got married because her whole perception was it's my family that is causing me all this distress my family i'm going to go so she disconnected herself from the family after the marriage and my parents were left with a gaping hole in their heart because they really took care of her she was the most pampered child i had to kind of fill up her shoes a lot of my time has been spent into trying to like just maintain the family look after my parents look after my siblings and all this that i've kind of i forgot to take care of myself mm. i didn't get the chance to take care of myself do the things that i wanted to do so when i hear things from her saying that like, why why she's just at home most of the time and she's just she don't have a job she don't do all the all these things this was in the past not anymore so if my sister is watching this i still love you i understand no worries <clears throat> but um at that point yeah but at that point it was it was really hard for me to just accept her mm. like accept right. that she was going through this condition and so being a caregiver comes with its challenges sometimes you have to put aside your own biases you have to put aside not okay not put aside so you have to process them mm. you have to process them and separate it from your reaction to them you cannot act on those feelings mm. so sometimes you can feel very like fake with your um the people that you care for as well like you just putting up a front with them when deep right. down actually you feel very different deep down you wish actually sometimes they just succeeded in hurting themselves it's very dark but it's yeah. a actual thing that i feel like a lot of caregivers sometimes it's a like intrusive thought that a lot of caregivers have how do you like do you have any advice towards how to process that definitely get your own help like you cannot as a caregiver caregiver burnout getting second hand depression from being a caregiver is very real because you cannot expect the person who has the condition to understand you and have the compassion for you the way that you have for them the capacity that they have is being fully utilized to sustain themselves so while they are doing that is very hard for them to extend capacity to hold space for you mm. as a caregiver so definitely get your own support system reach out get therapy because you will feel very burnt out you need a space where you can go and say whatever i just said lah but mm. without the judgement and um without people going like <gasps> yeah wow. I, i hear all this right and it's so freaking heavy and and there's so much to it right yes yeah really like i honestly want to say like shout out to the people in the med- mental health care like industries yeah yeah like having to navigate all this for other people like yeah. mm. before i met my current therapist i was going for counseling in polyclinic and uh i was telling her i don't know why i'm so angry all the time and i feel it i feel so guilty about being angry because i felt like i sacrificed so much and mm. it doesn't when i just needed a little bit of understanding and support from people around me for whom i have sacrificed so much yeah. and i wasn't given 
just what I requested, which was just space and understanding. I felt like, why is it always me, main character syndrome lah? And then she, the therapist asked, the counselor asked me, it could be because there are you're going beyond your values. Like you have certain values, or you don't recognize what your values are, and you keep giving yourself to people that mm. doesn't agree with your values. So okay. that's why you could be feeling this way. So then she gave me the homework to go sit down and truly reflect on what are my values, and when have I compromised my values to do something? What was the result of that? Action mm. and how can I avoid it the next time? When can I? How can I recognize that I might be compromising and set a better boundary for myself? The social component, like something that I realized also, was that whenever I go through like specific some episodes or whatever, right, I have a tendency to cut out social interactions completely. Mm. So then, yeah. one of the the stuff that I, I remember talking to the therapist about is that you have to just be very forceful and intentional with making arrangements so that you continue to have those interactions with people around you. But it's something that you. Like at least for me, I wasn't conscious that it was, it was something that I was doing. Mm. It just felt like I don't have energy to. Mm. But more often than not, when you do purposely make those plans and follow through with them, right? Does that help you? Half half, because I realized that some of them just completely misaligned, and then it's like I'm meeting people that don't bring value to to me at mm. all. So then it's then re refiltering and selecting the right people to meet as well. Yeah. So I have the opposite story. Mm. My mom was. Diagnosed first, depression and anxiety as well. Later on, my brother he asked to go and see a therapist. So I think maybe the silver lining is that because my brother is very well read, so he has a lot of general knowledge and he he's just a nerd in a sense, <laughs> but in, in a good way. So he, I see my brother's name is Dennis. So then I think he kind of realized yeah. that he was struggling with something, but it was a very difficult time for my family as well. Yeah. So then I was also <clears throat> going through some stuff lah. So. It was like almost one after another that we brought it up to our parents that we wanted to go and get therapy. And then after that, my mom got like she flew into a rage. So she said, "Woman, the place is a mental health unit, no? So we are just like a mental health hospital, lah. Like our house, everyone here is crazy, oh. But she, she was also battling her own demons, lah. Thankfully, my dad, the voice of reason, <laughs> <laughs> managed to he accompanied my brother to the polyclinic and all that. Mm. And then eventually, he got an appointment and went to IMH, lah. So, mm. but it's been like. Over a course of also like five six years, it has now come to a point where like my mom is also encouraging my brother to go and get help. As in, that's why it's so interesting that like your mom is the one that brought up and asked you to go. Yeah, I'm very happy that you shared it because I feel like every family, every household, everybody mm. goes through like such different experiences and the and the social circles that they have and the kind of support that they have also right for many people. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm. Or sometimes it could even be pushing you, making it even harder for you, right? Like, mm. like the way like your mom handled it earlier on, right? Mm. I, I feel like right now we need to really look at what are the options and the resources that are available and accessible to people. Accessibility is the really the key thing, right? Mm. Because in terms of awareness about mental health, a lot of people are really get it's getting healthier and healthier. People are aware, but taking that next step, which is the actionable step to start trying to figure it out or seeking help and all that, I think mm. that is the part that. It's a little bit difficult. Mm. I think yeah. this might be a good time to bring up that. So actually, as part of like the prep for this episode, I also got to speak to a mental health expert from Touch Community Services. Mm. So, like on the topic of asking, like, are there any tips for like how should I start confiding in my loved ones, right, about what I'm going through? And then interestingly, what they mentioned was that actually sometimes we might find it even more difficult, right, to talk to the ones that matter to us. Mm. So a lot of times, right, speaking to a stranger or a professional would help a lot more. So then they gave this uh, touchline counseling service helpline, which we'll put up here. Which is it? So that was quite interesting to me. So after you get that first step, I think you kind of like get your journey started, and then you understand a bit more about your condition and how to explain it. Then that would give you a leap forward in how to tell your family what is the support that you need mm. from them. Yeah, because a lot of times, so I feel like they're at a loss. And I, and so much of trauma and whatnot stems from your childhood, right? There's a high, high probability that your parents are somehow involved. You might have un subconsciously blamed them for certain things as mm. well, right? And when it when it builds up and then you go and address it without really truly understanding how to communicate it, it could end up with you fighting with them mm. when it's not needed or you hurting them mm. and then in in similarly hurting yourself even further. At least to me lah, what sounds like the right step would be to actually go and find the best way to learn how to communicate what you need to communicate first, then go and. Yeah. Something that you shared very early on in the episode, actually, which was that you were this person who was very confident, and you mm. felt like you were achieving so much, right? And you had all these motivators, and then it was actually your mental health journey that actually made you spiral down yeah. first. 
and then now this is where you are. But to play devil's advocate and feel free to shoot me down, right? Had you not started <laughs> on your mental journey, you could have actually been on a projection for like yeah. greater and greater and greater and greater things. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And so maybe people feel like if they are right now, I'm doing perfectly fine. Sure, there might be problems, but what's wrong with now, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to having to go through like now a one-year journey and mm. then finding myself all over again. The way I looked at it was... I think I pushed it back enough as it is really. Okay. The longer I neglect it, the bigger the fall it's going to be. Yeah. I'd rather just crash and burn now, mm. rebuild myself so that whatever I build next, whatever accomplishments I have next, I can truly have ownership over it. It's mm. not because I was coming from a place of lack, but rather it's something I really wanted to do. Yeah. It changed my entire perspective on life. It's a bit mm. more sustainable. It's mm. more positive motivators rather than yeah. making up for negative motivators. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm also curious, right, and maybe like this can be a bit of a takeaway for our viewers as well. Like, Do you think your friends gave you the support that you needed? Like, As a friend, right? if I know if I know someone that's going through this, how can I properly identify what they actually need and be that support for them? I think it really depends on the kind of friend that you have. It, it's a very individual to individual kind of thing but the first thing I would say is just listen lah. Mm. I feel like people hear react but nobody's actually taking time to listen just hold space for somebody and this is something that's still a work in progress for me because I tend to be very I want to just help the person right away mm. but sometimes what they need is just a friend mm. to just be there for you just hold space but do you think, say specifically when it comes to anxiety, right? Because I used to have a friend that struggled with that and then I go and Google. Then Google tell me, right, you can help them with the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 thing. So oh, when yeah. they're going through an episode, then you can, it's the one I see here. So it's like senses, 5 things la. you can see, then like 4 things like what can you hear? Then maybe like 3 things you can touch that kind to yeah. help them like ground themselves yeah. back in the present. Yeah. Is that actually helpful? Yeah, it is. Okay. It actually is. Because <laughs> okay. you are forced to, <laughs> you're forced to like focus back on the here and now. That's yeah. why I mentioned like yeah, there and yeah. then is where you're triggered from. Yeah. But when you come back to here and now, you realise you're not actually in imminent danger. Yeah. You're okay. You're safe. And that usually calms a lot of people down. For like, I mean, I've gone for therapy before. so And a lot of the exercises are, tr- are really that trying to bring you back to reality. Mm. That this, mm. is, it, this, this is the reality. Not what is happening in your head. Mm. Then you sort that out first. Then you try to understand why you were there and not in reality. And what the difference is and how you can come to terms with it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, recently through my EMDR, right, I just want to share this with you because I think y'all will find it pretty cool. My um, therapist, she installed a resource in me. So through Whoa. EMDR, you can install things in your psyche that can be what? used. Yeah. Symmetric. But what she installed in me was a safe space. A safe place. Right? Oh. Mm. Because EMDR <laughs> is a very, very intensive trauma recovery therapy. So it's focused on addressing trauma, bringing out memories that might have been locked away. I have to hold on to, to pulse, pulsation things in my uh. hand. Then in front of you, there's a light bar that flickers right, left, right, left. And then you're wearing uh, headphones mm. that also clicks right, left, right, left, Ooh. like this. And they're all in sync. So while you are, uh, if you're addressing more serious traumatic events, like you're going through those memories, right? Then the speed will be very high. Like they will speed up the like that. But if you're doing something more positive, like installing a safe space or installing a resource like courage, um, kindness, self-empathy, these are resources you can install in yourself through EMDR. The whole theory behind it is the, the bilateral simulation. It triggers your brain, right brain, left brain. Mm-hmm. And because trauma can be stored basically physically or from a sense, like you smell something right. that's associated with the trauma or something, seeing a colour is associated with the trauma. These kind of things can be awoken during this bilateral stimulation. Mm. And because you're firing up both sides of your brain, it's also easy to install things. Because during trauma, whatever we remember or hold in our brain, right, it's also an installation of that reality. Oh my God, it's like eternal sunshine. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Awesome thing. movie, guys. Yeah, I recommend I it too. <laughs> so it's real. It's pretty cool because I was, okay, of course, like, I have a little bit of cynical side to me as mm. well. La. So mm. I was always like, yeah, what can this, it's probably placebo. It's what I used to think. So then when I did this, and I genuinely opened my heart to it, I gave it an honest try. Mm. And she installed a safe space in me based on what I see. So she asked me, okay, what do you, when I say a safe space, a place that makes you calm and happy, what comes to your mind? And immediately it just transported me back to like a place in India that my mom's, um, my uncle's, front porch which has like a, a rice paddy field in front and it's like Ooh. a beautiful it's a beautiful place like every time I think about being peaceful I think of that place so I'm like yeah this place and then she asked me to like 
explain what I see. So I'm like really imagining myself being there, and I'm saying, oh, I see like a cow in the far distance. I see like breeze and like the, the, the coconut trees are all like swaying, and like sun is just nice. It's early early mm. morning. So she's very specific about which time of the day is it. So she's trying to really solidify that image in my head, right? Mm. And then she asked me, now um, I want you to give me a word or a phrase that will bring you to this place. Mm. I wanted to say morning, but she said that's too common a yeah, word. Every yeah, time yeah, someone yeah. say morning, morning, you just uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so then I switched it up. I gave her another one. I mean, I can share with y'all my safe space word. The keyword is y'all can bleep it out, lah. Like, I tell y'all, but I don't want okay, them. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. it's uh. Oh, that's okay. so specific. It's not, a word. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a word, it's a phrase. But if you hyphen so, it, it needs to be super specific. Yeah, it has yeah. to be. Yeah. So we kind of stopped the bilateral simulation after that. They do this thing called a distress test to see in moments of distress, will this work for you? Has it been installed properly? Right. So she asked me to think of something that recently happened that kind of annoyed me a bit, but on the scale of the distress, think of something that's at a three, not a 10. Right. Think of something at a three. So I was like, okay, I thought about it. Then I thought about my boyfriend, me uh, annoying me about something. And I was like, oh. And then she was like, <laughs> she was like, okay, now put your hand on your, your heart and say your keywords. So I was like, okay, say it. And she was like, what do you feel? And I immediately like just, I felt very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like you just let go of it yeah yeah so I was like huh maybe it's <laughs> placebo but we'll see so of course I communicated this with my family I told them that if at any point you see I'm a bit aggressive or I'm just say the words yeah just say say these things to me if you think that I'm being triggered in some right. ways right so I expressed this to my boyfriend also lah. like right after this therapy about a few days after my boyfriend and I had a little squabble and it annoyed me because I was also PMSing. So everything was just heightened. I was hungry. I was everything. Oh. <laughs> I was hungry. I was PMSing. Everything. And this is the whole trifecta. And then I'm like being over overly um triggered for no reason. I think he said it out of like just annoyance. He turned to me, he said, it's okay. <laughs> it worked eh. I went <laughs> silent. Oh. I was like oh, shit. And I really just like I went and I was like, thank you. He was like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It really worked. And I was like, wow, actually, yeah. Because I really think he said it like, as an annoying, like, yeah. we put it to the test, lah, that kind of thing, right? But when it worked, I was, I really took note of it. I brought it back to my therapist and I told her, this happened, eh? She was like, yeah, expected. I was like, wow. <laughs> so the interesting thing that she pointed out is that when you install these kind of things, even people you don't like saying these keywords, right, mm. will work. It doesn't, it's not attached to who is saying it to you. But I did find that when someone else says it to me, it's more effective than when I say it to myself. Right. Mm. Yeah, I was wondering whether like the more you use it, then the effect... It doesn't, person. it doesn't. Right. So why they need to install the safe space is because while we are doing trauma reprocessing, I can get pretty aggravated. I might feel very triggered by it mm. and I might even lose myself to a certain extent. And this psychological thing that she's instilled in me will ground me back. Right. right. And it's, it's basically a crisis plan. So it's funny, right? My older sister, because she also goes for EMDR, right? Then she, they install like, I don't know, 15 different safe spaces for her, right? <laughs> then anytime she gets triggered, uh, my brother-in-law just list all 50. She's like, this and that, this and that. And then she's just like, which one? I don't know which one. To go. <laughs> she goes through the glossary of the different. <laughs> so it's kind of, She got a bungalow. <laughs> she got a bungalow. Because yeah. she has so many different parts, right? So different right. parts might need different um, safe space. So How does the different part know that I need to go for therapy? Uh, oh, does she just need like three therapy sessions? It's kind of like having a boardroom. So um, she's kind of the head of the table. Right. Gaia is the head of the table and the rest of them sit around the place. Okay, okay. So when another part fronts, it's not so much that they come and sit at the front table. It's just that the attention goes there. Right, yeah. right. Mm. like a spotlight. Mm, more of a spotlight. I think something that I also only realised like later on and that the mental health expert also touched on is that mental health is really a spectrum. Like there's no like okay you are you are just depressed and that's it and then you like you're fully not depressed now you know like yeah. it's really it really ranges and then yeah. Yeah. but they mentioned that actually like a good like rule of thumb is to look at how disruptive your symptoms are to your life yeah like to decide whether like if you're not sure whether you should seek help like a good rule of thumb is that also yeah that's fair so enough. that's quite and how persistent this problem is like mm. how often is it disrupting my life mm. and then how disruptive is it. Yeah. yeah, I think a good thing to also acknowledge is that the whole mental health process, um, whether you go through therapy or get medication or whatever, it's not a linear thing. So I think I went into thinking, went into it thinking that, okay, I talk to somebody, then I'll feel better and back to life. Yay. Mm. 
my god, no. <laughs> um, I think the whole healing process hit me like a wrecking ball. I think that's the, the hardest part because you know that once you start this, you're going to have to confront something that you've been avoiding for a long time. Mm. Yeah. And change is going to happen and people, most people are always afraid of discomfort, right? Yeah. Of being uncomfortable. Do you think that currently, right, there is enough infrastructure in Singapore to be helping people that are struggling with this or struggling but not realising, you know? Mm, I think it needs to start from school. School? That's where we can normalise things. We have to go for regular checkups for physical body anyways, right? Right. So if we can just kind of extend that to the mental health spectrum, it's really not that different. You don't have to have severe conditions for you to finally go seek help. You just need to have regular checkups on with someone who's equipped with the knowledge to see if everything is in order. Then let's tackle it early on. And especially like we spoke about how like I think a lot of trauma not every but a lot of trauma comes from childhood anyway yeah. and so if you detect it early enough you prevent it from spiraling and yeah. becoming something bigger than it is. So I think just now I brought up like the topic of what is Singapore doing to help the people struggling with mental health conditions and Beyond the Label is one of the movements that is doing quite a bit for this and specifically for this podcast exclusively they've brought up this campaign called Emotions on the Canvas. Mm-hmm. So essentially they've gotten an artist to help Devika illustrate what she's been going through. So Devika wow. actually sent her like a write-up and then she has not seen the artwork. We have it with us and we are going to show her. World exclusive. <laughs> World premiere. I hope I don't cry. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, it's such an honour though to yeah. like present you with it. Yeah. So I'm- essentially, it's hopefully to help your caregivers like have a better picture mm. <laughs> of what you're going through, right? And also for yourself to, I think like, be able to process things yeah. and we yeah. have it with us oh, yeah. so I mean there's a digital version but we printed it for you so you, this one you can bring home ah. <laughs> I'm so excited really oh my god what an honour wow don't need to show the audience we'll put it up so you can just look at it yourself Whoa. there are broken pieces and I thought what was interesting is that the people around you are also like picking up some of these pieces right so I think your sister's hand has like a glass piece yeah. and then either your mom or your dad also has one so then it sh- goes to show like the support and all that. It has a sash here. Like yeah, because you are Miss Vasantam. Wow, <laughs> like the attention to details is amazing. Eh. So what is you want also want it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the really nice. Surrealism. What are your thoughts? What is, it, what is it like, you know, like seeing what you are going through, right? As an artwork. It's quite touching. Uh. I feel quite emotional, actually. You feel very understood. Mm. Like when I see this, I feel very hurt. I really appreciate it, guys. <laughs> 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 thank you thank you I really appreciate it this is lovely so we've talked quite a bit about mental health as well as how to navigate certain situations today and one other thing that the mental health expert actually brought up was about cultivating healthy coping habits Mm. so she gave me an acronym it's called basic PH so it's an acronym so B for beliefs A for affect which is also how you express your emotions S for social I for imagination C for cognitive and PH for physiology. They couldn't fit it in. <laughs> so not all of these points will be uh, uh, relevant to everyone, but it's a good guide to help you like kind of identify what is important and relevant to me, right? And then that will help me develop the healthy coping habits. Okay. Yeah. So there's more information like this, right, available on this website down below that we will put is beyond the labels resource page. So check it out and we'll link it in the description as well. Like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Beyond the Label is a nationwide movement against mental health. Sorry, against mental health stigma, sorry. Oh, wait, no, no, wait, <laughs> I missed out a very important word. Look.